the fight is fixed. The only way you don't win is if you don't fight. The, 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 the fight, fight is fixed. The, 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 the fight, fight. The fight is fixed. The only way you don't win. The only way you don't win, win. The only way you don't win is if, is if you don't fight, fight. Somebody who knows about it knows it's going to be a good one. Say amen to that. Well, if you would, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. And we are a clapping and amen in church. And all of our campuses, all seven now, have just come up and linked together. I want to say welcome to Resurrection Sunday morning. Everybody in Greenville, welcome all the rest of our wonderful brothers and sisters in our campuses and our church globally all over the world, it's amazing when your plane lands in London, as ours did at whatever day and time that was. I'm not sure what time zone or state I'm in now. I don't think. We just got back last night, and I had some jet lag. But when you are landing in London, and people are coming up to you in the airport and telling you they're members of your church, buddy, that's a new day. I don't mean I watch you on TV, but our our church pastors are right now pastoring people on the computer and there are people all over the world that join this church and it is their church home and they get their families together in a room in front of a smart TV and they are having church with us not watching us having church they're having it with us <laughs> and it just amazed me with people from all all nations just just come up and you're my pastor you're my pastor and you don't even hardly know what to respond or how to say but uh, we welcome all of you today, no matter where you are. <clears throat> My goal is not to drag a church service out. I think you know in the second one, we're not pushing quite as hard in the first one because we don't have the same logistics we're up against. Um, but one of my favorite, I'll give them a plug now, one of my favorite sandwiches is a firehouse sub. If you ever want to buy me one, I'll take it. Hallelujah. And I like them, the hero, that's got all the meat. I mean, the, the deer and the rabbit and the squirrel and everything, they kill it all and put it on that one. And then you get it fully involved. That's all the mayonnaise and all the juices and all the spreads. And all. And this morning, I had such a small amount of time, I had to take this message and cut it down to bread and ham. I'm going to give you all fully involved, if that's all right, here in the next few minutes. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3. This is resurrection morning. Many people call it Easter. I'm, I'm not going to get in a boxing match over that. I just like to call it Resurrection Sunday. I believe it's so much more powerful. <clears throat> and, um, you know, you, you learn about this guy and about this cross, and, and it was a bloody day. But so many times we preachers fail to give context. Why a cross? Why a need? Why the need for all this bloodshed? Why the need for Jesus? Why did he come from heaven down? Why? And so my goal is to take the short time I have. I want you to go out of here today and have the most wonderful resurrection day you've ever had. But before that, to take a cross <laughs> and put it into a context which gives you a scope of what this day is all about. And to do that, you got to go back to the beginning in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Adam and Eve are in a perfect place. They are perfect people. They are sinless people. And they're walking in the cool of the day with a perfect God. And something cataclysmic happens that has touched all the way to me and you today. The whole world got jacked up in an instant. 
People ask all the time, how could such a good God do such bad things? I'm like, God didn't do that. Sin did that. Bad things happen in the world because of sin, not because of God. Uh, God is a good God. But sin is a terrible, terrible bedmate. The wages of sin is death, and it has never paid a lesser dividend. And if you walk daily with sin, it will beat you down. What you see jacked up in our world is not because of God. It's because of sin. Jesus came to correct the things that sin has done. But somebody who's gotten saved is going to have to go take their faith and fix the stuff that's wrong. That's where you come in. Tell your neighbor, that's where you come in. That's where you. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3. Something happens right here in this story. Read it with me if you would. Yeah, my glasses aren't out far enough here. But by, by the way, these glasses are just for looks. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, hmm, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you are not going for God knows that in the day you eat, that your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. She also gave her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Adam, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. And I was naked and I went and hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? you been talking to I can tell by where you at you ain't been talking to the right people you only hide when you having the wrong conversations who told you you were naked have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you should not eat then the man said the woman that's just like a man ain't it lady just like the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree and I ate. So he went to the woman. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? She said, the serpent. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed. Lord, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen <coughs> and amen. Somebody who goes to this church, tell your neighbor, say he only preaches 15 to 18 minutes. Won't he do it? <laughs> I'm not big on titling messages. We have a wonderful creative department who helps me with those things. I'm not the most creative guy in the world. But if I were titling today's message, I would call it, This is what happens when you talk to snakes. That was good, wasn't it? I came up with that all by myself, too. <laughs> we come in in the middle of this conversation that Satan is having with Eve. Now, the serpent is not the enemy. The serpent is being used by the enemy. But through that serpent, the enemy has found entrance into a place he was not supposed to be. And Eve is having a conversation she never should have had. <laughs> The fact is, if that conversation had never have taken place, we wouldn't be here. 
If a lot of your conversations have never, never taken place, you wouldn't be a lot of the places that you've ended up and I would not have ended up in a lot of places <laughs> that I have ended up. <clears throat> and the fact is, most of the time when people get taken down by the enemy, we say it's because they're young in Christ or because they, are, they don't have a lot of the knowledge of the Word of God, which is the Bible, the Word of God, which the Bible tells us is our combatant when the enemy comes to lie to us and throw thoughts in our mind and condemn us and accuse us and confuse us. We have to use the Word of God as a sword, as a weapon. The fact is, the enemy was talking to her and she was giving it right back. He said, has not God said? She said, oh no, God, I'll tell you exactly what God said. God said, we could eat all these, but God said, if the ones in the midst, he said, don't eat them. In fact, he said, don't even touch them. And he said that there would be a result if we touched them, we would die. And so the enemy comes back, and every time he comes at her, she throws back to him what God said. So she is very aware of what God said, and she throws it back. But look at what the enemy is doing. The enemy is coming up against not her lack of knowledge, but coming up against what she does know. The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly or, you know, bullets and guns and swords and knives. The Bible says that our weapons we have to fight are spiritual. And the Bible details what they are. And the first word he uses in 2 Corinthians 10, we're fighting a battle, the Bible says, of arguments and knowledge that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Your battle is when your enemy gets in your head and comes up against something God promised and tries to make you think God's not going to live up to what he said. Did God tell you that you'd die if you ate this tree? That's exactly what God said. Oh, you're not going to die if you eat this tree. So immediately he's making an argument against what God said. And those of you in this building that you believe you have a good idea of the things that God's put in your heart and he said to you about your tomorrow, you need to expect an argument because all battles in life are not won and lost right here. They're won and lost in your head. You got to understand the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. My thoughts define my reality. How did I get here? I thought my way all the way here. Whatever you embrace to be true defines the reality that you live in so if the enemy wants to change your life all he's got to do is change your mind I've taught you for many years if you attend redemption or you watch by satellite or TV or, or internet I've taught you that every battle has to happen in the mind before it can happen in life if I want to prosper in life I'm going to have to prosper in my mind first if I want to be healed in my body I'm going to have to be healed in my mind first come on if I'm going to lose weight in my body I'm going to have to learn how to lose weight in my y'all ain't saying nothing right now because y'all all going to eat fried chicken when you but if I'm going to lose weight in my life I got to lose weight in my mind if I'm going to be a millionaire in my life I've got to learn how to be a millionaire in my mind y'all ain't saying nothing if I want to learn how to be delivered in my life I've got to learn how to be delivered in my mind and just like you learn how to win in your mind you also lose in your mind and this day Eve is losing She's losing the argument. <clears throat> she gives in to the argument he makes that God was not real in what he said. Now, the Bible says that Adam was made in his image. If I went to the restroom and I looked into the mirror, I would see my image. God made Adam in his image and in his likeness. When he looked at Adam, God was supposed to see himself. So after sin has come, some transition has happened. And for the first time, God looked into the earth but did not see his reflection. So he had to ask, where are you? For the first time, I looked in the earth and there was no mirror. And because God is supposed to look at Adam and see himself, because of sin, Adam said, you're no longer going to see yourself, so I got to go hide myself. See, sin causes God to no longer see the reflection of himself, 
and it makes us walk in ourselves, which we want to hide from God when we know that our life is presently not reflecting what he would have it reflect. God wants to look into the earth and see a mirror image of what he is, and Adam is hiding. Why? Because God can no longer see his reflection. Who told you that you were naked? I didn't tell you that. Who have you been talking to? I can tell by your location you're not talking to the right people. I can tell by where you're at in life your conversation is not healthy because your words begin to paint pictures of your future. Your words have creative power. All I've got to do is listen to you talk and I can tell you where you're going to end up. Even though I may not know you, your background, your history, or your education, if I listen to you talk long enough, you'll tell me right where you're headed. Why? Because words have life-giving ability to the direction of a person's life. And Adam is saying, I am naked. And God's saying, who have you been talking to? I can tell by your attitude, by your behavior, by your conduct, by your placement, by your running. You must have been having a conversation with a snake because you have not gotten this information from me. I have lost my reflection and you're under a tree hiding. You're sowing fig leaves. Everything ain't right. You have been talking to a snake. And so the snake, not being the enemy, was used by the enemy to pull two people down. Make sure that you don't ever let the enemy use you to pull other people down. Because if you notice, when God started handing out the curses, Satan didn't get one, but the serpent did. And if you let the enemy use you to bring other people down, when the curse comes, Satan will say bye, and you're left there to deal with the curse. See, that's what he does. He lets you think any old lifestyle is all right. And then when you get AIDS, he says bye, and then you're stuck with the consequences. Oh, it's getting quiet in here now. By the way, I preach a little different than most preachers. I preach on real topics. Hallelujah. He'll let you think that the drugs are harmless, and then when you get addicted, he says bye, and then he lets you live with the addiction. He lets you live with the curse. See, he wants to come and use you to do something. Then when you receive the curse of what you did, he says bye to you. But the one you just met today, all of you new converts, Jesus said, I am with you always. Hallelujah. I am glad that when I got a good day and a bad day, he does not tell me bye. I'm with you always until the end of the earth. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Good, bad, in, out, high, low. I am with you always. Somebody shout amen. <coughs> now, In Genesis 3 and verse 15, they might can get it on screen if they can. That's fine. If they can't, I'll quote it. God went on to say after he cursed the serpent, he said, I'm going to put enmity between you. He was talking to the serpent, but he was really talking to Satan and the woman. He said, I'm going to make what's in you and I'm going to make what's in the woman hate each other. It was the first prophecy. In the, I'll put into between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy about Jesus in the Bible. And it's all the way back in Genesis. <clears throat> telling me coming and telling you today that God has never been caught off guard. God does not come up with solutions after you've had dilemmas. God has solutions to dilemmas you have not walked into yet. Because your God lives in eternity and you live in time. 
And you've got to understand that all time does is it plays out what has already happened in eternity. That's why Jesus was on the cross said it is finished. In other words, eternity, everything's done. I've done everything I need to do. Everything is played out. But time reveals what God has already done in eternity. People that have prophetic gifts, people that prophesy, do you know what they do? They slip up into eternity and they get a peek at what God's already finished. Then they come back down in time and say let me tell you what God just showed me you ain't gonna be right here forever get ready for a shift get ready for a move God's about to change your life God's about to elevate you God's about to turn this thing around it's when people slip up and see eternity and come back into time and encourage somebody that it's not gonna be this way but God's about to turn this thing around can I get an amen anywhere in this building in reality, the 12-year-old boy David was just a shepherd, but in the mind of Samuel the prophet, he slipped up into eternity and saw that he was a king. So he went back and got the horn of all and dumped it on him at age 12. Why? Because he said it's only a matter of time. Ah. That's why he said, write the vision down and make it plain. Though it tarry, wait for it. Why? It's only a matter of time. For those of you that your, whatever it was you were believing ain't happened yet, it's just a matter of time. Your vision, it's just a matter of time. Your prophecy, it's just a matter of time. It's finished in heaven, but on earth it's just a matter of time. Touch two people and say, don't give up on it. It's just a matter of time. Oh, I feel something stirring up in my spirit. Somebody is receiving hope. Somebody, your faith is arising. Why? Because all you got to do is wait. You done done everything else. Just let it play out. It's just a matter of time. Shout hallelujah. John 3, verse 12, please. John 3, verse 12. Now, we move about 4,000 years forward. Jesus has come. The blood of thousands of goats, lambs, pigeons, and bulls have been shed. But all they do is wipe the way... A man sins for a day. There's no lasting salvation. But Jesus was called the spotless lamb, the precious lamb. The blood that he would spill would save everyone in all eternity. And there would never have to be bloodshed again. Jesus is here walking the earth. And he's having one of his first conversations with a man who's supposed to be smart. Have you ever been around somebody that was And you were just amazed. Nicodemus is an extremely educated, learned man. But he, Jesus is trying to talk to him, and he just can't get it. And Jesus says, I'm, I can't even get you to understand earthly things. If I can't get you to understand simple things, how are you going to understand spiritual things? Nicodemus, you, you church folk, Nicodemus, you're supposed to be smart. Those of you that don't go to church very often, forgive some of us church folk. We... <laughs> Verse 13. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. Tell myself, that is the Son of Man who's in heaven. Verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the... serpent I'm alright with Jesus comparing himself to kindness I'm alright with Jesus comparing himself to love I'm all, about, I'm all about him comparing himself to righteousness and holiness but now he's comparing himself to a snake his first conversation trying to explain to somebody what he's come to do he uses a snake. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Verse 15, let's find out why. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In other words, when I get lifted up like this snake, something's going to be available that up until this time has not been available. And then everybody should know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So he is now talking about this plan. The Bible says that Jesus was slain from the foundations of the world. Revelations 3 says that. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 20 says that. Three different times I know in the Bible he was slain from the foundations of the world. In other words, God had a plan to get sin back out because he knew man was going to bring it in. And the plan was already in place. That's why as soon as it happened, he said, let me tell you what's going to happen. There's going to be a woman that's going to give birth to a seed. A woman don't have seed. I'm going to put enmity between the seed of the woman. Women don't have seed. There's only one woman that had seed that has never known a man. And she was being talked about all the way back in Genesis. Mary conceived of the Holy Ghost and bore a child that did not have an earthly father. He only had a heavenly father and an earthly mother. His mother gave him his earthly body, but he came with the bloodline of his heavenly father because his blood could not be tainted by sin and iniquity and perversions and proclivities and everything that our fathers passed down to us. Oh no, his his heavenly father gave him his bloodline and though he dwelled in a body like you and me, he had the blood of a king running through his veins. <laughs> and so this plan was in place that Jesus would be the one that would redeem man from all of his mistakes. <clears throat> now, the serpent already right out of the gate and even until this day is reviled is looked at as evil, is looked at as a cursed thing, is usually never portrayed in any kind light. And now in the Bible, it's being depicted as the only living thing used by the enemy to come in and take the whole world down in sin. It is the most vile creature ever created, and then Jesus comes along, and the first comparison he makes is I'm going to be like a snake when I get on that cross. When that cross gets pushed up off that ground and I'm suspended between heaven and earth, it's no longer holy man, righteous man, healer, compassionate, water walker. When I am on that cross, I will literally become everything vile and evil and ungodly and unseemly that has ever touched the earth. See, you've got to understand, on the cross, Jesus was not Jesus. Jesus was sin. <laughs> the Bible specifically says he became, not he represented. He turned in to everything we don't want to talk about. Everything that I know about me that I don't want you to know about me. Everything that you know about you that you don't want me to know about you. Come on, when people tell their testimony, they don't tell their whole testimony. They just say things like, he's been good to me, and if you only knew how far he brought me. But they don't want to connect the dots. All that, Jesus, when they lifted him up, he was no longer the holy man, the rabbi, the teacher. He became everything reprehensible. And the reason Jesus had to die was so that everything about you, vile and evil, could die with him. The Bible says when he died, we all died. That's why the Bible says he who has been born again, that person.
person is a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's the reason that we celebrate on Sunday because on Friday everything bad about us died when he was raised on the cross and lowered back down. But on Sunday everything good about him was raised up and that's when holiness and righteousness and love and purity entered back into the world. And I want you to know the fact that Jesus got up is an indication to you and me that everything is possible to him that believes. Nicodemus, don't you understand? I have got to become everything that people hate like the serpent. In other words, I've got to bear a cross to ultimately get to where I want to go. And while people think it's going to be my worst day, it's actually going to be my best day. John chapter 12, I'll read one more scripture and I'll get you ready to go home. John chapter 12, verse 27. My soul is troubled, Jesus said, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He's about to go be crucified and he's like, I don't want to do this. He don't want to bear his cross any more than you. He said, what do I say? God save me? Because in other words, if God pulled him out of that moment, you and I wouldn't have this moment. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Get all the glory you can out of this cross. Glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood and heard it said it thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Verse 30, Jesus answered said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. But for your sake. Can I just keep reading here? I'm having a good time. Now, this is the judgment of the world, and now the ruler of this world is about to be cast out. (laughs) The sin that has dominated everybody's life since the serpent took Eve and Adam down. When they lift me up and I become the serpent, when I become the sin, when I become the evil, I'm going to take sin and I'm going to kick it out of the earth, and men are going to know what it's like to have their sins set free. Why? Because the one who has been the dictator of this world World, I am about to take him out with one fatal blow. Yes, for three days he's going to bruise my heel, but for eternity I'm going to crush his head. Somebody shout amen. Good God Almighty. Woo! <coughs> Jesus went on to say in that chapter, and I close. He said, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. He said, but if it dies, it produces many of itself. I'm going to tell you something that I hope you can wrap your mind around it. God's plan has never changed since the garden. God wants to look in the earth and find a son. I don't mean son by maleness or femaleness because in Christ there's neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew, bond nor free. God don't see race. God don't see gender. God don't see see classifications. That's men that do that. In the Bible, sonship is not maleness. Sonship is a position. All God has ever wanted to do is look in the earth and see himself. And he said, Adam used to look like me, but sin destroyed it. So I'm going to become the sin, and we're going to kill it. We're going to kill the serpent on the cross. And when I come up on the third day, we're going to remove the fig leaves, and I'm going to look back in the earth, and I'm going to see myself shining back at me again. You can go to the store today and buy some seeds and put them on the shelf and they won't do you any good. But if you put them in the ground, most of you would say, it's going to spring up and going to produce. No, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to die. For the many of you that just got saved, 
I wish I could tell you now that you know Jesus, the party's on. Jesus issued this invitation. Take up your cross and follow me. Crosses are passageways. Whenever you are bearing a cross in your life, the cross of a loved one that's causing you pain, the cross of a crisis, the cross of a disappointment, the cross of a failure, the cross of bearing pain in your soul. When you are bearing the crosses in life, crosses are passageways because God's trying to kill something so something else can live. Whenever God takes me through the crosses in life, there's something in Ron that's got to die. But there's a life on the other side that is much more than the one. If it remains alone, it's just one seed. But if it dies, crosses are passageways. Every time something good's happening in your life, have you noticed that there's always something bad happening? Have you noticed that it's always the best of times and the worst of times at the same? You know when somebody asks you how you do it, you can go to the good stuff or the bad? What do you want to hear first? I got some good things happening. Why? Because there's always something dying so that something else can live. <laughs> but the message of that is your greatest fruitfulness is usually born out of your deepest pain. May that be true today. Put your hands together all over this building. Can I get you to stand with me, please? <clears throat> now, I am taking it so that since this altar call, everybody under the sound of my voice is saved. So when you're picking up your kids and leaving your parking space, I want you to act like it. If you're going out to eat and the waiter and the waitress is overwhelmed with pressure and stress, act like it. Be a light in the darkness. Be a city on a hill. Would you do that? I love you. We care about you. Take time getting off. It's much easier. This campus was built with tarrying in mind. It wasn't built with hurry in mind. We have tables everywhere. We have umbrellas everywhere. We have decks to sit on. We're serving dinner here. We're serving meals. We have coffee shops. We have lounges with TVs playing everywhere. If you want to miss some of the line, enjoy what has been built, not for me, but for God's people. Enjoy it. And most of all, find somebody you love today and let them know it. Because Easter is the day love lives. Okay. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine among you, upon you. May the Lord establish you and give you peace. In Jesus' name. Touch your neighbor on both sides and say, just want to tell you one last time, he's alive. He's alive. I will see everybody. Oh, I didn't do communion. I was so proud of myself that I was getting them out early. Lord Jesus, I'm not even Catholic, but I feel like I need to do a cross right now. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I have no excuse except I forgot. Hallelujah. You got me one. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Jesus said you got to love me anyway. That's my fault. So you got to love me. Anyway. Jesus tried to prepare his disciples for this night. Pull back that keyboard just a little bit, my monitor, Brother Simon. Thank you. Jesus tried to prepare his disciples for that event. He called them all in a room, and he, then he looked at them and made this startling statement. He said, one of you is a devil. Knowing that Judas was sitting in the room. They said, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Is it, is it I? 
And he said, the one who sticks his hand in the dish with me, he is the one. And about that time, him and Judas' hand touched at the same time. Their eyes met, and Jesus looked straight at him and said, what you going to do? Go do it quickly. He ran out and sold the prince of God out for 30 pieces of silver. I bet even today in the bowels of hell, Judas can hear the jingling of 30 pieces of silver ringing in his ears. As just a little bit of money, he sold the Son of God out. <clears throat> Jesus left with the rest, took out the bread, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. He said, it's broken for you. He said, take and eat, and when you do, remember me. Would you take of the bread and the body of the Lord Jesus? If you need to say a hallelujah, you can let one out now. His body was broken so yours could be healed. See, he was broken on the outside so your physicalities could be healed. He was broken on the inside with his blood so you could be healed on the inside. The Bible says in the same manner he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood, and it is an everlasting covenant. In other words, there's not going to be another one. This is the last one. This is the only one. This is it. And he said, I want you to take and drink. He said, and as often as you do, he said, remember me. Would you take of the cup of the Lord Jesus and drink? Now just lift your hand right where you are and thank you. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Well, let's just give him a little bit more time. I, I can't do that and not say thank you, Lord Jesus. Let the mothers in the house say thank you, Lord Jesus. Let the fathers in the house say thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm I believe bodies are being healed right now, even as we're speaking. <clears throat> I can see migraines being taken away. I can see blood diseases being healed right now in my mind. I can see it. I can see joints being restored, knees and ankles being recreated. I can see muscle diseases being healed. I can see people with sinus problems, digestive problems, intestinal problems, nervous problems all kind of internal problems, respiratory problems. Oh, I see God, the, the healing of God running to those places right now. You can't touch the body and the blood and it not affect you. I also see the blood moving to perversions and addictions, and bondages, codependencies, and going to all types of twistedness and embarrassments things we want to hide and put fig leaves over them, but the blood washes them today. The blood washes them. Just like the hymnist said, what can wash away my sins? Everybody in concert, nothing but the blood of Jesus, put that cup down and put your hands together and give your God a prayer. I do so apologize. I would not minimize that event for nothing. I hope you have the greatest day, Resurrection Sunday, you've ever had. I hope people are nicer to you than you've ever seen them be, and that you find somebody to sow Jesus to today. Now can I bless you again? Let's try this a second time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you, establish you, and give you peace. And may the Lord make fleas from camels and fest your arms. If you don't come back Sunday, next Sunday, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen.
God bless you. Y'all have a great day. We love you.